credit to go to college without having to take a remediation course once they got there, if they needed to, if they were not already in honors. And then the famous course that they all love so much, algebra and finance, we don't offer that course anymore. But they love to take it. Um, it, it was a very, it, it, was a, it was a simple course, but it was also a life skills course. That's why they like it so much. But that, those course, that information has been built into our new course of study. So I put this graphic up here because this helps explain that flow. Okay, this is in the course of study. Now I'm going to come up here because I'm, I, I, as a teacher, I was never really behind the, the podium, but the mic is on and I want the folks at home to be able to get it. But I'm coming out behind him. So, K-5 all the way up to 6 is just your regular math. And in 6th grade, I know back in the day they were used to um, maybe a 6th grade honors or advanced class. We no longer offer that because it, the standards themselves don't change for either, the, for, for either course. But the difference comes in when they get to 7th grade because they then have the option to take what's called accelerated. And accelerated um, are for, for students who'd like to get on the honors path and get that early algebra one exposure. So if they go into accelerated seven and eight, that's algebra one over the course of two years. That then gives them the option to get to high school and opt out of algebra one in high school. So at that, that point, they won't need a credit for algebra one. However, on their transcript, it won't say that they have a credit at all for algebra one, but it's understood and recognized by the state that they can graduate if they take and successfully pass accelerated seven or eight. So here's the caveat to that. If a student leaves the sixth grade and goes to regular seven, then they have no option to go to accelerated eight if they're doing well in it and they realize they, they can do some faster paced coursework, they don't have that option to go to accelerated eight because they missed half of the coursework required for the two course sequence. So if they do well here, they just have to do real in, in, in regular eight, okay? If they go to accelerated seven, then they can go from accelerated seven, and if they don't do so well, if it's not fitting them, then they can drop down to regular eight, and that's just fine because they will have gotten more in regular seven to make them successful in, I mean, excuse me, accelerate eight, seven, to get them successful in regular eight, okay? Um, either way it goes, no matter which path they go on, they're all gonna end up in geometry. At that point, just because they did not take accelerated in middle school does not mean that they can't take honors courses in high school. The students can still go into honors geometry if their grade and their their standardized tests support that. Um, and if the parent requests that they go to honors geometry, absolutely, they can go to honors geometry. However, it puts them at a deficit because they did not do the accelerated in middle school. So if they don't do the accelerated in middle school, then they do have to take algebra one in high school and then follow the course sequence as it flows, which means they don't get to these courses over, I'm sorry, down here, those AP courses. So if you have a child that goes to Davidson or um, Baker or MGM or Bryant, they all offer AP courses. But if the middle school that they went to before that did not go to, um, did not offer accelerated, then they don't have that opportunity to go to the AP course in the end. They will end off on one of three, these three courses that I mentioned before. The finite math, the math modeling, and the uh, pre-calculus. That would be their ending point. Which is why this, this, se this session was kind of hard to put together because I didn't know which angle to come from. So we're just going to talk about all of them. Okay? So here are our course options now for 12th grade. I want to just give you 12th grade. So as I was explaining before, if you're on the regular path, if the student's on the regular path, then they will go to mathematical modeling. So they will, all students will take the same courses if, besides the students that did the accelerated, they will take the same courses, geometry, algebra one, algebra two. 12th grade is when they get to the differentiation. 12th grade, either they'll go to mathematical modeling and that'll put them on a regular path. Honors, they have more choices. 
for honors, they can then go to pre-calculus or uh, applications of finite math or AP stats, AP calculus, depending on if they are able to get to that fifth math. Now, I asterisk those top two courses because those two courses are also offered dual enrollment. So if a student wants to still gain college credit, they can do that through the dual enrollment courses as long as there's a teacher on campus who can offer dual enrollment and teach those courses through uh, some, most schools do Bishop State, some schools do um, South Alabama. If you do South Alabama, then you'll be taught by South Alabama professors. If you do Bishop State, then you will have the option to be taught by uh, MCPSS teacher. All right, course expectations. So very, very similar to, um, to ELA. Well, let's say this. ELA and math are two very high stakes subjects because our data unfortunately says our kids have a hard time reading and writing and they have a hard time doing math. And why is that so? A lot of times they can't do the math because they cannot read and they cannot write. But we are trying to put together some efforts to make sure that they can do those things. So as I was listening to ELA, they were talking about their cycle of instruction. How effective is that? It's effective enough to come over into the math realm. We follow the same cycle of instruction. So all students are expected to learn each set of standards designed for each course. The MCPSS math department has designed math pacing guides to support students meeting those standards quarterly throughout the academic year through the use of digital and print resources. So I put that, that last piece on there because our students love technology. They want to be on the computer, they want to be on the phones at all times. But much like ELA, they need to write. So the only way you can do math is if you write. So we've been encouraging teachers put away those laptops, pull out that pencil and paper like we used to, and write. So our curriculum for, well, I can't talk about Savage because that's for 9 and 11. For, um, for 12, we use a different curriculum, which then promotes our students to have to read and write. Now, just like ELA, our math curriculum is for 9 12 through Savage. So they have those student companion books where they can tear out and write on and all those different things. They don't have that for the 12th grade. They do have a lot of online components with 12th grade. But at the end of the day, just like when I was teaching, get your notebook, get your pencil, and let's get these notes, good, no, good note taking strategies, and let's write. The hardest thing for our students, and I realized this while I was teaching, I said, like, y'all take notes. Y'all write down everything that I write. What is the problem? When you go back and you look at the notes, what's the one key thing that they've forgotten to write? The directions. <laughs> they just got a bunch of numbers on the, on the page, and they don't know why they did it, so they go home and study. And that's why I didn't do open note test. Why? You didn't write the directions, so your di nothing will correlate to the directions on the test. You've got to write. So note taking is a skill that we had to Bill, especially when you're talking about preparing a student to go off to college. Because their, their goal in college is not to prepare a student to take notes. That's a skill that they should have already acquired before getting there. And you have to get it how you live. And unfortunately, a lot of our students, a lot of students everywhere, learn how to do it when they get there the hard way. <laughs> so that's why we work so hard on making sure you're taking, you're taking good notes that will help you be successful in your course. Okay, so part of our expectations, and this is what we teach all our teachers to do, is that we have standards for mathematical practice for students. These eight practices are what we want our students to do all the time, all the time in our math classrooms, every day. Now, not all eight every day, of course. We want it to spread out. Students should be exposed to doing these things. So number one, making sense of problems and then persevering. I believe perseverance was one of y'all's words earlier or something, something very close to that. Y'all said tenacious. Y'all said tenacious, right? But we still, we need them to be tenacious in math as well. The only way you, you ever learn math is at first you make sense of what you're, what you're doing, which means you have to know how to read it. And then don't give up. 
you got to keep going until you get to an answer. I'm not saying this has to be right, but do something to get to an answer. We can fix all the rest of it. But if you stop in the middle of doing the work, I have nothing to work with, right? So we want to see how you're thinking. Okay, reason abstractly and quantitatively. Our students do very well with numbers. They do. They do well with working with numbers and adding them. They do very well. It's the abstract thing they don't do real well. So they can add 2 plus 2. Oh, but when you ask, ask them to add 2 plus B is equal to 4, where did that letter come from? <laughs> Every time. I hate little. I know. <laughs> That's the abstract part. You, But our students, the thing is, our students know that two, if, if I got 2 plus B and I, it says it's equal to 4, that B has to be 2, but that B throws them off every time. Because they're, they're worried about what to do with the B as opposed to figuring out what the B is. I probably should use a different letter. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to use the, You're getting close to English. Yeah, yeah, I got the. Yeah, I got the. Um, you, yeah, let me use a different. Language. Anyway, let me move on. All right, so construct viable arguments. Oh, we've got our students. Look, oh, they love to talk, <coughs> right? But they got to talk about the right thing. Our students. Uh, have y'all been on? I love the number three. Constructing viable arguments and critiquing the reasons. Of, have y'all been on Facebook? Yeah, I think y'all know I'm going with this. Been on Facebook and they put up a math problem. And everybody getting the answer, right? Everybody's answering because they use PEMDAS to answer the problem, right? And everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. But nobody, because they, they learned it wrong. But the most wrong person has the longest argument as to why they're right, right? We want our students to be able to construct viable arguments. Although that person is wrong, they had a reason why they're right. I'm not asking that your reason to be right right now because our purpose is to teach you how to get there, right? It's going to take time to perfect that. However, we want you to effectively be able to articulate why you think your answer is correct. And if it's not, we'll fix that. <coughs> Number four, model with the mathematics. Being able to put your hands on it and show us what you're thinking, right? Why are you thinking? What you're, that's just showing your work. That's making a graph and saying, well, this is the reason why. Being able to show us that. Number five, use appropriate tools strategically. So my biggest thing for math teachers is calculators. Our students have to know how to do things by hand. You don't always have a calculator on you. You've got to know your mental math. You've got to know that nine times six is 54. You need to know that, right? That's not something that we need to always plug into the calculator. So using those <coughs> uh, tools in the street, attend to precision. I always say math is the most precise subject out there. Right? It's either right or wrong. There's no in between. It's either right or it's wrong. And what you do in between will determine if, <laughs> if it's right or wrong. Right? So you've got to be precise because I always tell the students negative 30 is not the same thing as positive 30. And if you don't believe me, go check your bank account. <laughs> you don't have no money if it's negative. You owe some money if it's negative, right? So I, I always get. You put stuff in money terms. Oh, they're, they're eating up. I understand it now, right? Oh, money. Oh, I got it. They can count that and tell you how much you owe them by the time you get done talking about money. Look for and make sense of structure. So see whatever patterns in there. If there are always patterns in math. As a math person, I'm always looking for, if I'm trying to solve any problem in the world, I always look for, okay, what's the pattern? What, what do I see? How is this always happening? And we do that. We do that very often. When we, when we talk, when we're in school, we're talking about some, a student that's uh, chronically absent, right? We're looking for the pattern. Why is that student always absent? Oh, what day is it? What time do they, what time do they skip? Play? What time do they come to school? We're always looking for that pattern to get down to that solution. And then number eight, look for and express irregularity and repeated reasoning. So again, seeing the pattern that's continuously going on in that, and this number seven and eight is something that's always going on in the classroom. When you're solving equations, there is a pattern to it. Every equation is not the same, but there's a pattern to solving equations. And if you get that pattern, then you can solve the equation. Then you don't have to worry about what B is because I can get to B without having to worry about am I multiplying or dividing or adding or subtracting? Or do I use pendulums or do I, you don't have to worry about all things because you know the pattern. So we're worried, that's what we want our students to be able to do. All right, so again, going back to what we're expecting to see in our classroom as far as our teaching and the learning is concerned with our students and our teachers. 
This is called the graduate release model. I put this on every presentation that I do because it's very, very important. We want our teachers to start off large, and then all of a sudden, they kind of taper off. Why is that? Because if our students are not talking, they're not learning. If they're not collaborating, they're not learning. If they're not working, they're not learning. If I'm talking the entire time in class, how am I ever gauging what the students are able to do? And then I got the nerve to talk for 45 minutes, the bell rang, and I slap them with some homework. <laughs> and then what happens when they bring that homework back? If they bring it back, it's wrong or incomplete, right? Because I didn't see what they knew in class. So it's very important that, yes, I give them time to watch. I, let, I model it because I have to model it. I can't assume that they know anything. Then I let them practice with themselves or each other. And then you do it by yourself. This is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some kind of assessment, right? I'm going to give you some kind of assessment so that I can go back as a teacher, look at it and say, OK, all of my students, yeah, we got to go back and review this information. We need to do this tomorrow. And, uh, and I believe ELA brought it up too, a bell ring. Right? We'll start off with that. We, this is the problem they missed yesterday. So I'll start off with that tomorrow with a bell ringer to see if that works. See what I can do to fix that. See what the misconceptions were. Because again, we're trying to make them successful math students. We know our students are already coming to the door saying, I hate math. They don't like me. But I have to make them like me at some point. Right? And that's only meeting them where they are. And the only way I can meet them where they are is to know where they are. And then I go there. Okay? And then uh, do it on your own where they kind of go back and reflect and do a little bit of homework if you so choose to give them homework. Which, I'm, a, I'm against homework. I'm against because honestly for math, for math, it's somewhat a waste of time because we don't effectively all the time give homework. We give them 30 problems, they do that for homework and bring it back tomorrow. Well, if they didn't know how to do number one, that means they've been messing up for 30 problems. That's, that's a waste of a night. And they've probably worked on that homework for two or three hours just trying to get through with it. And that's unfair to the student. So that's the kind of person I am when I'm teaching them, when I'm going out to my teachers and I'm explaining all these things to them. We have to think about the psychology of a child. What is it that we want them to do? And the only way we're going to get them to do it without somebody else doing it for them is to let them do it in class and let me watch you do it, right? We don't want our students. You know, AI is a great thing, but AI is going to take home. And AI is going to do the homework home. You know, we're going to do it in class because at least I can monitor. Because if you go home, chances are, you know, I have students, and I'm, I, you know, I like to tell stories because I, I was in the classroom and I to tell a story or two. I was in the classroom. And um, I, I taught my students, and I gave them homework, and they went home and they used photo map. Okay. But what the students do, what the students do is they think that they're being smart, right? They write down all the steps. This I know this is right. Photo map told me, but they come back in with steps I never taught, <laughs> using symbols I never used. <laughs> Symbols I didn't learn until college. And so I said, what does this symbol mean? Oh, uh, oh. Uh. I said, work it out for me real. Oh, uh, oh. Uh. I said, you know, that symbol means such that. It's a, it's, a, it's a C with a line in it. And that symbol in math means such that. I said, I didn't learn that until my sophomore year of college. How did you get it? Well, you should be up here teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, I got our roles reversed, right? So we have to monitor those things. Right? We want our students to be successful. We don't always, because at the end of the day, they can do the math. They count themselves out before, before they even start. So we have to give them the tools in order to be successful and let them know that they can be successful. All right, so mathematical modeling. This course is designed to hit these particular standards. So this is, and we're now we're looking at a first quarter view. This is what students will be working on first quarter in mathematical modeling. And remember, this is for the students that are on the regular diploma option. 
So they'll be evaluating, evalu um, excuse me, algebraic expressions, uh, solving equations and inequalities, understand and use inductive reasoning, understand and use deductive reasoning, um, use estimation techniques to arrive at an approximate answer to a problem, and apply estimation techniques to um, information given by graphs. So a lot of these concepts they've seen before in various courses, and then some of these are just kind of everyday concepts that we learn, like inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. That's that's regular thing when you get down to a, a solution. So a lot of students like this class because they get to use everyday skills. And this is also where that financial literacy is coming in. After this quarter, they'll be looking at um, some financial models, so they'll learn about mortgages and interest rates and all those different things. So they love that. And then, oh, teachers love it too because they come with the best projects all of a sudden. I mean, they've got the best ideas when it comes to credit cards and buying a car and budgeting. Oh, they, and then they drag it out forever, right? We do that all year long. They, we, that's our budget project. Yeah, well, oh, okay. Um, so, but we, we do allow our students, I mean, our teachers to have a little bit of freedom in this class to work with the students. This is the opportunity to see what the students, the opportunity to see what the students really want and tailor the class. Now, we do have a pacing guide for them, absolutely. But they can tailor the class to, um, to meet the needs of the student. So then next we have uh, finite. And this is a class that is for the student that is on the honors track but don't really want to do heavy, heavy math. This is more kind of mind-bending, real abstract math. I like to teach, back in the day this class was called uh, discrete math. If you have a student that come in and has been in 12th grade, maybe took some discrete, this would have been the class. So uh, in the first quarter they do some uh, reasoning and problem solving. They do sets and set theory and then they do some introduction to uh, logic. And so here this Venn diagram represents a set, a set of two elements where they uh, intersect here in the middle. Um, so they'll be doing things like that with Venn diagrams, and then they do things, this is logic, so that's a truth table there. And had I thought about it, we probably would have done a truth table today. But I didn't think about it. Um, so, but that's what a truth table is like. And the students really enjoy this class too because it, they understand, they know it's a math class, but they like the, the, the lack of numbers in it. <laughs> right? They like that. Our students like to think outside of the box. They really do. And this class gives them the option to say, hey, this is cool. So when I did this after I taught truth tables, I taught them how to do truth tables, and then all of a sudden that's okay, build your own. And they were able to build their own truth tables with given values and then pass it along to a classmate to have them to solve it. So all they had to know were these symbols at the top to know what that meant and then fill in the truth table from there. But there was a pattern to it. P, Q, and R, there's a pattern to P, Q, and R, depending on how many elements. But that's what they'll see in finite, so that's a very fun class. And it's not a class that a lot of people are exposed to, so if the students come home and say, hey, come help me with my homework, and then you see this right here, don't, be, don't freak out. It's math class. Um, you might have to do a little studying with them. Because, I mean, this class does require a different skill set. And then pre-calculus, of course. Pre-calculus was my baby when I was in school. I loved teaching pre-calculus. Um, and so I always call this kind of like big algebra or algebra three. That's what we can look at pre-calculus like. So it is the beginnings of calculus work. So if your student is going off to college and they major in something that's math-based or science-based, they will go into a, um, a calculus class of some sort. So in the first quarter, they'll work on functions and then they'll work on systems and matrices. So here's what we call a function machine. So they have inputs and outputs. So they put something in into this, into this expression, plug it in, and then they get out a number. They like functions because they're pretty. And then um, systems and matrices, systems of equations, and then matrices, and here's a depiction of a matrix. And then they learn how to do different operations that they add, subtract, multiply those matrices. And they do very well with that um, in general. And so those are some of the highlights of first quarter that you can see in each of those classes um, for a senior year. I only put the courses up here that are state courses. I did not put any courses up here that are AP courses. 
because not all students go to AP, but they can expect to see college level work there. So we do want to talk about a little college and career since we are, um, <coughs> we are, uh, since we are 12th grade, so this was all, this is always the other part of like a senior teacher's at duties. We do it just because we know what's going to happen next. So we always tend to talk about college and career in the class. We embed that somewhere. So I was online just kind of searching and searching and searching, and I found this checklist that I thought was pretty comprehensive of what a student should be doing from junior year of at the spring of their junior year all the way up until graduation time. And as I looked at it and I put it and before I put it up there, I said, is this is this about right? I said, yeah, this is about right. This is about right. And I and the website is down there. It's getschool.com. Getschool.com. And this um, is up there. So the spring of junior year, we should be studying for the ACT because we're taking it that 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 semester, right? Um, Build a list of criteria to help you choose and apply to colleges. Create, this is the big thing, in junior year. I think our students sometimes wait till the last minute. You need to have a list of colleges junior year. Because by senior year is the time to be applying to college if you haven't already gotten early acceptance into your college of choice. And then create a, a, a brag sheet. That's just something they put on there. I mean, they can do that or not. Um, finish strong, make a summer count. All right, and then now, create your senior timeline. And I know these two senior teachers, and Ms. Wigfall being a senior sponsor, she is always on crunch mode. She's always got a timeline for them. Their senior year doesn't last very long and blunt because she's always got them busy. So um, request some ACT. So I always say, if you didn't get the score you wanted junior year, take it again. There's nothing wrong with taking ACT again, especially for some reason, a lot of our students it, it, historically, they wake up senior year and realize they want to go to a school, and then they look at the requirements to get in the school, and they realize, oh, I don't have the ACT score I need. What do I need to do to make it? Now, all of a sudden, you're paying for remediation courses, tutoring courses, class one-on-one. -on -one. You know, all these people coming in, private tutors, making sure they stay at school, because now they realize, I need the score that I want to go to school, right? And our, our kids have big dreams when they go to school. They don't want to go. <laughs> they want to go D1. They want to go to big school. They want to go to Alabama and Auburn. That's where they want to go, right? But I tell them, when you you go D1, you got to have D1 academics. So you got to make sure that you are doing what you need to do. So you need to look and see were you being lazy on the ACT or not, right? So. Finalize ACT scores, making sure that's taken care of in the fall because you've got to make sure you're starting to apply for those schools. At this point, you should be down to just a couple of a couple school options. This is the big one. Senior teacher tell you the same thing. Go ahead and fill out that financial aid. Get on student studentfinancialaid.gov. Student student yes, yes. studentaid.fafsa. Yes. Do your FAFSA, fill that out. Start writing some essays because requirement. And a lot of students, they don't get scholarships because they don't want to write the essay. Write that essay. Write it and, and be through with it. Submit your college applications. By the, by the spring, your students should already know where they're going. They should. That doesn't mean that they have, they, not all of them, but by the spring, they should know or be waiting for letters. By the time they graduate, they might be able to go to summer school and get started, get some of that prereq work out of the way. So the spring, start applying for some scholarships, plan some trips to these schools because they want to go to these schools, and then they get there and it's like, oh, this is not for me, right? Take them on these college tours. I know a lot of schools do a good job of taking students to schools, which is a good thing. But on your own time, call the admissions office and say we'd like to schedule a tour. They'll let you come up there. Choose your college. Review your uh, financial aid. Make sure all that stuff is um, sent in. Woo, this is a big one. Housing deposits. <laughs> There's no room at anybody's school, right? If you want to be on campus, and in most schools, freshmen are required to be on campus the first year, or at least the first semester. 
So you've got to secure that housing, sitting at the positive. I've been accepted. The first thing you need to do is pick up the phone. Is how much is it? What uh, do you take a check? I'll mail it in. Can I call you on the phone with it? Something. Go ahead and get that deposit done. Uh, register for orientation, which they'll send you all that welcome package normally in the mail and all that kind of stuff. Um, send your your final transcripts once you get it, and then go to school. That's just your college, right? Those are for students who are geared to go to college. Now, we're not saying that every student has to go to college. That's not what we I would never preach that, right? Because some, well, <laughs> I tell you, we've got a lot of successful students out there that didn't go to college and making more money than the folks that taught them. Out the gate, we're still trying to scrape to get that, right? So, um, so we do have some options in school about the career pathways which this is a work that should have started in the 10th grade. So every school has their signature academy, which by the time they end, they, uh, they leave with a credential in some area of interest, which is why students are kind of everywhere when it comes to high school, because they have options based on signature academies on where they go. Um, not that they just go to their own school. But the in-school credentials, so it's a three-year sequence in most cases, where they take a foundations course and then some specialized course and then at the end they do some type of the internship or some shadowing or something like that um, to get them that credential. Those are for students that want to do that. So, uh, so students credential either way. Let me put it that way. On the, on the college side of things, they were credentialed with getting a proficiency score on the ACT of a 19. If they get a proficiency score of a 19, then they have. Now the national benchmark is a 22. Right? But the state benchmark, well, the state benchmark is a 19. So if they get that, then they have a credential according to the state. Okay? If they choose not to go that route, if they choose not to go that route, then they have the, the, the career route. Okay? And then uh, our CRI or something that they will have to obtain, I think it's what is it, two to get one? It's two to get one. So um, uh, those are career ready indicators. They have to get two of those to equal up to one credential. Okay? So, for example, a lot of schools have a, a business pathway, which means they would have to learn Microsoft. <coughs> they would have to learn Microsoft, they would have to pass two Microsoft credentialing tests. So they're like Word or PowerPoint or one of those, or two of those, excuse me, to uh, get the CRIs, and then once they get those CRIs, they can do that. Some schools have hospitality, so they do guest services. They have to take that test at the end. Uh, many schools have CNA, the CNA program or allied health program where they will become CNAs once they complete that, and they have that credential. So they have different pathways, and some schools have some specialized things, like BC Rain, they have the aerospace. Uh, Williamson has maritime. Um, Bryant has something on the wall. So, yes, so all these schools have these different specialized, and because of that, students do have the option to go to schools that, kind of, that meet their uh, needs, almost like declaring a major, right? So that gives them that, uh, that benefit there. So you've got a lot of different options for uh, your students when they get there, and we're not, again, we're trying to make our students college and or career ready. They can be both, they can be one or the other. We want to make sure they're successful in any realm. But the key to success in any place is to get this formal education first anyway. Right? And so we have to make sure that, that message is very clear when we're talking to our students and making sure that's why this is important. This is why you're taking math and for nothing else that you have that background so that it makes you successful. I can't tell you the number of shoulda, coulda, woulda stories from students that come back and say, oh Lord, I wish I would have done this while I was in your class. I know. I told you, you should have done it. But, it, but it's okay. We, they, they get on their feet. I always happy to see their uh, their faces when they come back. All right. I got to breeze through this thing. What time is we get done? 245. Ha! 2.45? What time is it? Oh. You okay. got to give them five minutes to get down the hall. First. That's okay. I got a small game for us. It won't take us very long. So I hope you were paying attention. Because you got a quiz. You got a quiz, ladies and gentlemen. Let me get out of here and pull my quiz up and see what I got to recap. All right. Uh, mm -mm. Mm -mm. You 
know, that's how they used to try to get me. But I always, I already knew those tricks. We're going to keep all this the same. We're going to change that. We're going to hit publish and we're going to play the game. <coughs> all right. Yeah, we're going to do classic mode. That's fine. All right. So if you got your phone with you, you can take a picture of that um, <coughs> QR code there. You can take a picture of that QR code there, and it will let you into the game. If you do not have, then you may work with a partner. You may work with a partner. Mm. <laughs> it should let you in and ask you for your name or some kind of nickname or something like that. So. And we're doing this, a lot of our teachers play this game in their, in their classes. This is called Quiz Is. And a lot of times they play it in class to recap, do some kind of assessment with the kids. Or they're even assign up for homework. And the students will just do, the, do it at home on, on a student-based option. So it's very uh, likely that you will see this. We try to gamify a lot of things that are across the curriculum. Um, because it's very important that our students also have a bit of a brain break. And this gives them that. Although they may have to think a little bit to answer the questions, it still provides them a brain break because it inspires that competitive nature. Now, kids are very competitive. Kids in general are very competitive. And so everybody wants to win. I think the question was earlier, uh, what's more important, to stand up or, or to win, right? This case is more important to win. <laughs> this case is more important to win, OK? Um, but in, in, in every case, you all have the right answer. It is important to stand up, because when you stand up for what you believe in, you are winning. Um, is everyone in that can get in? We're all good? Thumbs up? OK. So we just got a few questions for you. Your questions will appear on your phone. Let's see who the leader is going to be. So did you like that game? So that, yeah. So our, this is what our students can see. And then on the, on the teacher's end, just as a recap, we're able to kind of go back and see, do like an item analysis of questions that were commonly missed. So that gives me another opportunity to go back with my students and see what I need to go back over with them so that I can clear up any misconceptions that they may have over whatever content that I covered in this particular um, session. So I hope that, not, that, and then on the flip side of that, it was another way for you to engage with the material. So you were able to look at it again, and sometimes when you read it for yourself, it kind of it sticks at that point. So now I, I, they ask me a question, I know the answer. So now you've got it. So I hope that in this session that you did gain something that you did not once know, and you kind of know where your students are headed at this, in this point, in their 12th grade year, and kind of what to expect with your students um, this year. And as always, because I'm on this side of things, if you ever need anything, please let me know. Feel free to contact me. If you have anything to write down, I'll give you my email address. You can write, you can email me anytime. My email is klamar at mcpss.com. It's klamar at mcpss.com. And you can contact me at any time throughout the year if you have any questions concerning your, um, your students math education. If nothing else, I thank you all for coming out. Hey, listen, four is more than I expected for seniors, so thank you so much. <laughs>